Mr. Sununu, thank you for coming. It's good to be here. You've got a busy time. You get a little time off now, I trust? Uh, a little bit. Now, we, the U.S. Congress, really insists that we will not give the most favored nation trade agreement to the Soviet Union unless it uh, gives Lithuania its freedom. Aren't we putting the uh, Soviet Union in position of, if they decide to do it, set them free. It'll be the result of an American bribe. Isn't that an awkward position to put them in? Well, I think the President, uh, President Bush, President Gorbachev, were very careful not to make that specific linkage in, in the discussions they've had. Uh, the only linkage that uh, has been made is to the Immigration Act, to the codification of those uh, uh, processes. And I think that that separation is a very important one in order to get uh, any movement at all that assures uh, over a reasonable period of time there will be freedom for Lithuania. Well, in their press conference today, it wasn't quite, not to me anyway, wasn't quite that clear. Well, let's just say that one of the talents of statesmen is that they craft things very, very well. <laughs> to fuzz it up. All right, George. In the weeks leading up to the summit and at the summit, the Soviet position on arms limitation seemed often to be, as with the SS-18, a new generation of which is coming, trying to secure the right to do more than the United States wanted them to do. Now, the fact that the Soviet Union is a mendicant, an economic basket case, and yet is pushing for the right to do more in arms than we want them to do. What does that tell you about our policy assumptions, which are, as I understand them, that the Soviet Union is A, poor, and B, wants to stop being poor? One of the most important beneficiaries of, of the right of both the Soviet Union and the United States, for example, to modernize, would be the United States, which would retain, uh, I, I assume, uh, as well perceived, our capacity to do things well in that direction. I'm not questioning who and benefits. I'm saying what does it say about our assumptions about Gorbachev's real aims and determination to improve standards of living, that he wants to retain this right to spend more, not less, than we want on arms. If, if one enters negotiations, uh, you, you go into them knowing what the strengths, the weaknesses, the positions of advantage, positions of disadvantage of those with, your, with whom you're negotiating. And I think our negotiators on arms control <laughs> understand both what the Soviet Union can do and intends to do, or might intend to do, and I think that's been built into the discussions. I understand We that. have an equivalent problem here with a Congress who is now talking about drastic cuts in defense, and that has to be taken into account. They've both been, I think, considered in, in the positions we've taken and what we've agreed to and what we've refused to agree to. Let me try and ask the question another way. That is, would it not be more convincing in terms of Gorbachev's protestations of wanting to increase the standard of living and modernize the Soviet Union if they were not fighting for the right in these agreements to spend more on arms? I would rather they had the right to do it and not do it then they say they didn't want to do it and end up doing it. Well, I, let me ask a question that I asked three times with no effect to no, Mr. No, I think uh, I gave you a very no, I'm talking about answer. Mr. Gerasimov, about Germany. Uh, a lot of what makes this summit seem like a kind of empty ritual to people is you have two leaders, Soviet Union and the United States, talking about what is and is not acceptable regarding Germany. Is it not the case that the Germans will get what they want, and what they want is Soviet troops out in Germany and NATO? I think both the President of the United States and President Gorbachev at the news conference today said, uh, and it's an important outcome, I think, of the discussions that took place, that Germany will have the right to uh, make a decision in, in terms of what direction it wants to take with alliances. Uh, implicit in that are a whole host of things that, that is, is certainly what? consistent with the conclusion you've drawn. I understand, but then is, it does, is that also not consistent with the judgment that this is somewhat, this kind of summitry is now an empty ritual since it had no effect on what will happen with Germany? Uh, even though certain conclusions uh, over a long period of time may seem to be uh, highly likely, what you have to do is carry out a process in order to get there. And I think what you are seeing in this summit is the developing of the relationship between the United States uh, and the Soviet Union that will allow a lot of good things to happen. Governor, I want to go back to David's question to you. The trade agreement signed and the possibility of most favored nation status for the Soviet Union down the road. The president today said the only linkage was to Soviet immigration, the liberalization that their parliament has to go through. But is it not correct that the president will consider what is happening in Lithuania and Gorbachev's attitude toward Lithuania in making final decisions in this matter? There's no way the president of the United States is not going to consider a whole host of uh, uh, issues as he determines yes, whether or not to send it up. I, it, there's no question it's going to be on the list. 
So in fact, if the linkage on the table is just immigration, in his mind, there's going to be linkage with Lithuania. There's going to be linkage with a whole host of issues and, and what happens in terms of, of the, the steps that take place in the Soviet Union towards political reform, towards democratization, towards the structure of, of the republics is all part of what the president has to decide. A, in terms of, of whether he is even inclined to send the trade agreement to Congress for action and B, whether he determines that whether he sent it up there, would Congress act on it in a favorable way? Uh, the president is not going to send a trade agreement up merely to send it there and let it sit on a table. I want to ask you about a couple of other issues having to do with Congress. Let's start with the Clean Air Bill. Will the president be able to sign that? Uh, we think that what came out of the House, with one major exception, uh, the, the uh, Wise Amendment, which was a variation of the Byrd Amendment that the president said very clearly he would veto, uh, it gives the conferees something to work with. And if they can work out some of the differences uh, between themselves and themselves and the administration and uh, clean out the, uh, the offending amendment, I think we're going to have a Clean Air Bill as a result of the president's initiative uh, and Congress's work on this uh, that the, the country will But you're saying that amendment has to be modified, has to be completely eliminated? I think that uh, there's no way that a modification of that amendment satisfies the intention of the amendment. Why don't you explain to people who don't know, which is most uh, Americans, what this the amendment is, is that you're talking about? There is an amendment added to it that would create uh, an opportunity for a lot of ambiguity as to whether somebody uh, that uh, lost the job, lost it because of improved productivity uh, or because of the impact of the Clean Air Amendment and virtually every job in the country would in one way or the other be indemnified, uh, paid, paid for by the government for the loss of the job. Uh, if help that to people who lose a job. The second issue is taxes. Beyond the current help that we yeah. have. The second issue is taxes. I want the Sununu formula now on whether taxes, formula today, are on the table in a full way or whether they're simply on the table for debate at the end of which time the president will reject it. The principle of no preconditions for discussions means that there are no conditions going in and there are no conditions on what must come out. Then why did you and say what you principle. said in the airplane two weeks ago? I made it very clear that, that no preconditions was not equivalent to people assuming that there was a condition of taxes being in the package that came out. That's what I said. But you sent a signal to conservatives that, in fact, at the end of the day, the president could be trusted to keep his pledge, no new taxes. I think no preconditions is no preconditions going in and no preconditions on what comes out. So it's all right with Sununu if the package that emerges has new revenues called taxes. I think the president, when he sent his budget up, had uh, about $13 billion worth of revenues in it that were perfectly acceptable. I think we are going to have negotiations on the budget dealing with some of the tough issues. Those negotiations are underway. And I think if the president signs the package, it's going to be one designed to continue economic vitality. And one that will keep his campaign promise? I think you're going to see a good package come now, forth. No question, Governor. One that would keep his campaign promise? I think that the president is going to get a package that makes a difference to this country. I give a positive George. direction. Go ahead. Uh, in order for the United States to continue its contacts with the PLO, the executive branch has to certify that the PLO has kept the promise it rather ambiguously made 18 months ago, saying, although it's never engaged in terrorism, it will stop. That's roughly what the agreement was. This week there was an attempted terrorist raid on the coast of Israel. Mr. Arafat has neither deplored that raid nor moved to discipline the members of the PLO who undertook it. Uh, will the United States continue, as it has in the past, to certify that the PLO is uh, somehow not responsible for continuing PLO terrorism? I think the President made it clear that we deplore that raid and That's that, not the that, that kind of a, an action is, is not constructive in terms of getting people to uh, be willing to discuss things and uh, the State Department will certainly evaluate both the information that they have and other people have in determining what the proper status and, and uh, certification or non-certification should be. And what I think is, that that's something that the uh, President, uh, Secretary Baker, Brett Scowcroft have got to spend some time on. Facially, do you think they're in compliance with their undertaking? I think the fact that, uh, that uh, such a raid as that uh, took place creates problems not only in terms of getting the Israelis to the peace table, but I think it is a, a detriment to the peace process as a whole. The Seabrook plant opens today. That pleases you. I thought it opened yesterday, but go ahead, sir. Well, does it please you? Uh, well, I think it's important to this, this country that we not turn our back on any, any energy source. I think nuclear power is a component of it. I think as folks start talking about the problems associated with burning fossil fuels, CO2, uh, wh whatever impact that has, uh, we do need all our energy resources. We do need 
uh, I think, not only Seabrook, but a, a broader outlook at what energy resources we have. That's what Watkins is doing in his analysis, and uh, I think you'll see a recommendation. Well, it gives you satisfaction uh, in this particular instance, it's Governor New Hampshire. You won this battle. Well, as long as you get the right result, you don't <coughs> have to uh, 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 express any glee at a good result. It's a good result, and I'm, very, I'm certainly pleased that the Northeast is not going to be, at least for a short period of time, as power short as it would have been otherwise. Yes, we're Sir. back to Gorbachev for a moment. Uh, a number of people have sort of thrown up their hands saying this is much too timid. Uh, this three to five year movement to prices still fixed at a higher level, like a modified command economy. Are you depressed about this or encouraged? I think the most encouraging thing, not only the discussions that, that uh, took place with President Gorbachev himself, but those that were part of the delegation, is that they understand where they've got to go. They are now, I think, uh, arguing amongst themselves, debating amongst themselves, both timetable and, and components of how to get there, but it is a much more constructive approach than, than we've heard uh, in, in terms of internal debate in a long time on that. Mr. Sununu, thank you. Thank Thanks you. for being with us. Good to be. Happy to have you. Come again. Coming next, our discussion here with no agreement promised, and That's joining us will be Cookie Roberts of ABC News. In a moment. <laughs> One more note on the summit before we go on to other questions. Is there anything in your recollection in modern or any, anywhere in history as grotesque as what Boris Yeltsin is doing in the Soviet Union? He has had himself, got himself elected president of Russia, which is the biggest element of the Soviet Union, about half of it, and has immediately opened negotiations with Lithuania which uh, has tried to withdraw from the Soviet Union, and uh, Gorbachev would not let them. So what do we make of that? George, you... No, what is grotesque is the Soviet Union. And, and well, yes. Uh, but Russia, uh, at least, is, is a, a sort of ethnically, linguistically, culturally coherent thing, more or less. Got this one had it. bizarres. But it, it is interesting that while this, this rather empty and hollow summit was going on, the most interesting and important thing was happening with the election of Yeltsin. Look what they were talking about here. Arms control, which now is quite peripheral to our security arrangements, as I believe it always has been, but now is even more so. Germany, which will go ahead and do what it wants to do, irrespective of what these two gentlemen have to say about it. And the Soviet economy, which is a third world hunter-gatherer economy, minerals, oil, and furs. And there's not much we can do about that either. Well, you know, Gorbachev this morning and Gorasimov in our program said we'll have to wait and see what Yeltsin's attitude is. I think, I think the We've attitude is in. We? Boris Yeltsin is not going to get along with Gorbachev. And I agree, it's not just personalities. Yeltsin represents a federation, Mother Russia, that wants to secede from the Soviet Union perhaps every bit as much as Lithuania. Well, and it, it <laughs> creates so many problems for him, not just in terms of his own political problems at home, but, but we're seeing uh, reports that Soviet, the Soviet Union's trade with Japan is disappearing because the Japanese say they're not getting paid for their goods. And among other things, they say, suppose it does all break apart, then who pays us back? Is it the Russians? Is it the Lithuanians? Is it the Ukrainians? You know, and so that, that whole thing just adds to the threat of the economy well, I've been numerous apart. reports of Russian bills not paid. Not paid, yeah. exactly. David, what strikes me is that usually we think that institutions are slow to ch change, but ideas can change quickly. I'm impressed in the last 18 months by the fluidity of institutions. Whole nations change, constitutions change, laws change. But the intellectual inertia of the leaders is so striking to me. The fact that we well, continue to go through the motions of talking about could. arms control in Germany, and again, that's the wrong agenda. We bring, Mr. Gorbachev comes here and we say, what can we give him that will do him good standing with the Soviet people? They want soap. They don't want summits. But arms control is not the wrong agenda as long as the arms continue to exist. It does, it does create... Uh, an atmosphere of uh, stability and peace when you are destroying nuclear weapons rather than building them. And I think that had this agreement been made a year ago, everybody would have it's hailed it Soviet, as a very Tokyo, significant agreement. It is agreement. the Soviet agenda to talk about arms control because then they don't have to talk about democracy. Well, it's also no. our agenda. It has been our agenda Wrong all agenda. during the That's, Reagan administration That's exactly before. what I'm talking about is the intellectual inertia. But let me tell you something. Changes. The issue of trade, we're focusing, it seems to be, on the wrong thing when we look at this little trade agreement they signed, which doesn't amount to much, or even MFN down the road, which may not mean that much. Underneath this, American entrepreneur businessmen are going over to the Soviet Union. It's not just McDonald's. I was talking to a guy yesterday from Albuquerque, New Mexico, 
who's going to show cartoons in Soviet movie houses. And he's shipping over to go with them popcorn, the oil for the popcorn, butter, the big bags. And then what's he going to do with all the rubles? Well, well, where's, where's the, rubles? the problem is how to get the rubles out, but he thinks he's got this solved, too. Well, he can get them out, but then well, what's he, he going to do them with out, them? But they aren't worth anything. They're not That's even right. good as subway tokens. <laughs> no. Well, just George. a moment. Let me just tell you something. McDonald's isn't over there. It has a way of getting them out. This guy can figure it out. What I'm saying is that the trade relations between these two companies are not just Archer Daniel Midland and Cargill and all the big grain exporters. It's now a lot of American entrepreneurs, or Robert well, Trent yeah, Jones Jr. putting up thing. a golf course. Pepsi Cola sells a lot of Pepsi in um, Russia. What do they get for it? The, ru the rubles cannot be brought here. They're no good. So the Russians are giving them ships which they can then sell for dollars somewhere else in the world. Well, Hard Donald and Kendall vodka. wouldn't be over there if he was getting nothing that was well, worth they something. That. So they uh, do it Cargill wouldn't be selling the grain. Of course, that's but, a different thing because well, they sell the exports in Europe. Is, look, their real problem is what George said. They don't produce anything in, in excess that many people want, and they don't pay for anything in money that is usable. So that it's a well, fundamental trade problem in a global economy. But they're going to. But I agree with everyone here, it's not going to be the Soviet Union that does it. You it may be Mother Russia and Azerbaijan and Armenia and Lithuania and all of the republics. You were saying how rapidly countries change. We might put in a plug for our own, which does not change. Thank the Lord. On the other hand, Canada, our nearest neighbor and one of our closest friends, our biggest trading partner, may be in a process of historic change if Quebec pulls out, as it may. Um, among many other effects, it would mean that uh, Newfoundland, um, what's the other one? Uh, Nova, Nova, Scotia. Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island would be isolated from the rest of Canada and cut off by uh, Quebec. And so they're talking about, there's been some talk about joining the United States. Uh, not a bad idea. What do you think? Well, what do you think? Well, I think if they join the United States, we'll welcome them. I mean, it's a question of whether Puerto Rico or the provinces will be the 51st state. But that doesn't help Canada, and that doesn't help no, the dissolution that. of that, that federation. Quebec is going to be separate? Probably so. The rest of English-speaking Canada to the west can probably economically take you know care of itself. You know what's remarkable? Is that here they are. They are our closest neighbor and biggest trading partner, and yet it has not succeeded in Canada and, and any place else in the world in doing what's happened here, which is as we look around the world now and see all of these breakups going on, and as the Soviet authoritarianism withdraws and everybody gets to fight again, uh, you see that people have really not been able to live with each other and uh, had the kind of interaction of various Tokyo, ethnic it's a rise groups. Of but that's something that, that has taken place in this country, uniquely in this country. But we are homogenized, or believe we are, or trying to be so. We are one peoples. Quebec never, the French never joined the English. But, the, but why not, is my point. My, there they are, right next door. Because they weren't door. forced to in the beginning. There wasn't the question of force in the beginning. Yeah, you know, it's an old and I mean by force, not just force of arms, but a force of pressure to become one peoples. It's an old, old joke that Canada is like Vichy Soir, cold and hard to stir, but in fact it's, it, it's easy to stir when the issue is something that people care about a lot. People are not economic people, homo economicus. People that care about things like religion and culture and language. Most of all, we have the same language in this but country. Something, by the way, point. to think about as we talk about bilingualism. Canada. You have that in Canada with every other immigrant group that's come. Canada has a large number of I'm Greeks, stamped. a large all number I'm of is Asians. That if, if Quebec did not speak French, there would be no separatist problem there. On that point, let me raise a point that David mentioned when you say our country, thank goodness, doesn't have the problem. In the Southwest, where people speak Spanish, it's bilingual society, and as you know, for some years there's been the problem of whether all the signs should be in both Spanish and English, and whether English should be the official language. There is a rising movement, it seems to me, which eventually, perish the thought, could lead to separatist talk. Leaders who spring up and say, the old Texas, West Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, that federation, which uh, is part of Mexico ought to return to Mexico. It was part of Mexico once. Oh, absolutely. Well, we well, bought it. Not as, not as long as we stay rich and Mexico stays exactly. poor. Exactly. That's not well, going to happen. Well, let's move on here. <laughs> the mayor of Washington, D.C., Marion Barry, has admitted the use of cocaine after first denying it. He's been indicted on, uh, the last I heard was at 12 counts. His trial begins, what, this Tomorrow. 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 
Unless there's a plea bargain, a last-minute well, plea maybe bargain. So. We, don't, we don't know what he will do, but uh, he's been saying that he doesn't think any jury will convict him because at least one juror can be counted on to say, I will never vote to convict Marion Barry regardless of what anyone says. And that has been known to happen. What are we to make of that? It's a, say, it's a very cynical view, and he has spent this past week really playing to prospective jurors, of uh, being available for all kinds of interviews and talking about how uh, he really didn't do anything so terrible, that perhaps he wasn't a good role model, but he didn't really uh, get upside the law in any very serious way. And he's really going after the, the well, people of Washington, D.C., hoping that he does convince what a jury has happened before here? it's picked. What has happened here is what Marion Barry has been an awful role model in this community, and now he's decided to be divisive from the standpoint of race relations in taunting the white community by saying, in effect, black jury in Washington, there'll always be somebody there, regardless of the evidence, who will vote to acquit me. He has been contemptuous of the black community because there is no history in this town, thank goodness, of black juries letting black defendants off, regardless of the evidence. Black juries convict black defendants in Washington, D.C. every court day of the week. And to say that, to imply that because of his race, meaning the white establishment is out to get me and so some good black juror will keep me in office, is contemptuous of blacks in this town, it's divisive race relations, Mary and Barry ought to be condemned in the strongest language. You just did. Well, I'm getting <laughs> almost hysterical. <laughs> I can <you> tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one year from Tiananmen Square. Anybody have any thoughts about it? Yeah, anything new? Anything we haven't heard, George? It's worth bearing in mind, we've talked for the last 18 months about all the changes in the communist world for the better. For most people who lived under communism 18 months ago, life today is worse than it was then because the vast majority of those living under communism then weren't our Chinese. Well, these were people in China living under communism that had not begun to liberalize politically at all. In fact, they had been repressive. Uh, who can, short of George Bush perhaps, who can find a good word to say about the Chinese leadership in this affair? It's, it's really remarkable, though, because you say short of George Bush, and, and here we have the Soviet leader in this country, an argument about whether to extend trade relationships to the Soviet Union. The president has already granted those trade relations to China, and they do seem completely isolated there, and yet uh, this administration is accepting them. Koki, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Our time is up. <laughs> See you at the same time, same place next week. We'll be back with a few words about a politician who loves to talk to a group of congressmen who don't like to listen in a moment. Finally, our city here, Washington, has a well-deserved reputation of having too many talkers and too few listeners because it is a city of politicians, lawyers, specialists, experts, researchers, consultants, all of them eager any time to explain anything. So if you think you know everything, it is on the face of it impossible for anyone to teach you anything. So why listen to him? So this is how it was when President Gorbachev invited congressional leaders to the Russian embassy for a question and answer session. They had one hour, he said. A senator's first question was about Lithuania. Gorbachev's answer took half an hour. Rambling, detailed, tedious. Senators who love to talk and hate to listen squirmed in their seats and looked at their watches while Gorbachev went on and on. In Russia, after all, in the past, politicians have been known to speak for four, five, six hours. But to talk that long requires an audience forced to listen, forced out of fear of prison or Siberia. Gorbachev held it down to one hour. The senators listened, squirmed, hated it, and Washington is not used to that. For all of us here at ABC News, until next Sunday, thank you. This Week with David Brinkley, brought to you by Apple Computer, the power to be your best. And by GE. From satellites to medical systems, we bring good things to life. Tonight, watch ABC's World News Sunday. At the dinner hour, join ABC's Peter Jennings and Forrest Sawyer for a complete wrap-up of the Superpower Summit here in Washington. ABC News, America's Choice. If you wish a printed transcript of this or any other This Week with David Brinkley broadcast, 
please send $4 to This Week with David Brinkley, 267 Broadway, New York, New York, 1007. Monday, watch ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings for a complete look at the day's top stories. This has been a presentation of ABC News, where more Americans get their news than from any other source.